If you know the song, you can sing with us, but just worship the Lord in spirit and truth with us this morning, okay? Now move. Sing, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. In my heart.
Let's give the Lord a praise in the house today. This is the day the Lord has made. Take your electronic device and focus on that. Don't take a picture of it, just. To do this, because I know you all like to do this worship from memory. Well, that won't work this week. We have a special call to worship. You can also follow the words. They'll be put on the screen. Uh, at this time, let us prepare our hearts and souls for worship. Praise God from whom all blessings. We're having problems again in Denver. In and out, in and out. I don't know. We just told them that if I turn their devices off, I guess people can use them. Tad and turn the description stuff, he say you can read it on the board. <laughs> Call to divine worship. Hello. Hello. The human rights of people living with or affected by HIV AIDS. We take this moment to lift up the millions of infected women, men, and children who suffered the misguided judgments of a world that would shun them and shame them. that we are able to provide healing for the sick, comfort for the troubled, and hope for the forsaken. Amen. Now let's join in the Unity Choir singing, it won't let me Come, listen. all ye faithful. Sorry. That's very sweet. She can hear me.
Amen. You may be seated. We're going to call now on our own Sister Sharon Brown, who will lead us in the invocation. It'll be followed by our call response, and then our Old Testament reading, Sister Bertha Gatson, and our New Testament reading, Brother Isaac Bryan. to spread amongst us. Let the people be more mindful. You're trying to tell us something, Lord. We need to listen. We need to... Make amends. It's okay to say I forgive you or I'm sorry, but it starts within. You gotta let the old, old you go, God. And I thank you for me, for giving me a new beginning, a new purpose to serve only you. <laughs> All right. Because joy comes in the morning, y'all. Not at night. We got to thank God. And at night, we got to go ahead and let things go. Don't go to bed with all that hatred and hostility in our hearts, Lord. We got to forgive. Lord. As we go out today after hearing a word from our uh, illustrious Daphne Ward, as we hear words about AIDS, we forget about all these things. This is still real. Let us go out and be a beacon of light 
and give those people glory. Help those people. And we know that Jesus is the reason for the season. So listen, don't forget that it's all because of our son, our father, our master, that we are here today. I thank you. Name, amen, amen, amen. Speak ye comfortable to your, your Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received the Lord. And hills shall understand his meaning. I don't know why this just happened, but may God continue to bless us in his will. Amen. coming from Mark, the first chapter, the first to the eighth verse. And it reads as follows. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, 
who will prepare your way before you? The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John came back to Jerusalem, went out to him, were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He preached, saying, there come one after me who is mighty than I, who signed a scrap I'm not worthy to stoop down and loose. Verse 8, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. May this word find a dwelling place with us on our heart. All that dwells below the skies. A summary of the Decalogue. Soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. I see the Gibbs family coming in, and I think they're going to do a special presentation for us. They're going to light our Advent candles. Good morning. Good morning, church. Good morning. The things we get for Christmas will not last as long as the things we got from Christmas. We will finish our Christmas. But the things we get from Christ this Christmas, hope, peace, joy, and love will go with us all our life. Do you remember what the first Advent candle represents? Yes, it represents hope. Jesus is our hope. He died on the cross to save us and give us everlasting life. The light of hope shines in the darkness and darkness has never put it out. Today we light the second Advent candle. The second candle is the candle of John the Baptist. To 
to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus is our peace. His peace is deep within us, reach, reaches out to friends and strangers, and brings justice to our world. Dear God, thank you that even through there is no special star in the sky or the angels sing, there is a real sense of peace within us at Christmas time. Thank you that you are always with us sharing in our good and bad times and giving us your peace. came to us, there was just Kim McKay. Now they're three and a half. I'm looking at the Washingtons, uh, um, Sister Michaela, you know, uh, the, the, the Jackson family. Don't drink the water or you might have an addition. Good morning, church. Welcome to our first Sunday services. First, I would like to welcome all of our new visitors, whether you are <clears throat> on Zoom or in the sanctuary, we welcome you to our services today. As a reminder, the church school and worship services will be live streamed. at 6 o'clock by Zoom. At the conference, we will hold the remaining The trustees will meet in person on Tuesday, December 7th, at 6.30 p.m. Christmas at Campbell. Providing free COVID testing with their food distributions on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays at 1 p.m. Adopt a family program. Christmas at Mitchellville. See the flyer for those first two. Cornerstone and Campbell Chapel December the 10th, uh, see the flyer. LDS Night in Bethlehem, December 11th. South Carolina Conference Christmas Gathering will be on Saturday, December 11th at 1 p.m. at Mother Emanuel in Charleston. Campbell Chapel Christmas Eve, also there will be a flyer that you will get that information. November 31st at 11 p.m. All of the Sea Flyer informations will be on constant contact, so that way you will have it ready and available to participate. We also pray for our sick and shut in members with calls and, if possible, visitation. Again, thank you for listening and have a wonderful day and the remaining of the service. Amen.
Okay, in the chat. Good morning. Good morning, Campbell Chapel AME Church family. Uh, my first video, I guess, didn't work out, so we're going to try to do take two. Good morning, Campbell Chapel AME Church family. Uh, my first video, I guess, didn't work out, so we're going to try to do take two. So we have an adoptive family here. This is one of our children. Uh, we have a five-year-old girl. Um, she wears size 10 to 12. Her shoe size is size one. She has no allergies. She is not picky. Um, her favorite colors are pink and purple. She's a girly girl. Um, she He wears size 7 to 8. His shoe size is size 9. He likes dinosaurs. He has no allergies. His favorite color. We have a two-year-old boy. Uh, he wears size five to six. His shoes side as well. He likes trains and fire trucks and baby boss. And he would also prefer healthy snacks. Um, the family states they are really in need of winter wear, uh, such as like long pants and uh, long shirts. Um, so if you are interested in donating to our adoptive family this year, please contact me. Um, you can either donate an unwrapped gift, or if you prefer that I go shopping, you can donate uh, money. I will take that as well. Uh, the gifts will be wrapped. We thank God for all those announcements. You are holding baskets, and if you raise your hands, the ushers will come to you. And at this time...
things come of thee, O Lord. Actually, December 1st is World AIDS Day, but we didn't have church that Sunday, that day. But we have church today. Amen. And we're remembering all those who have uh, suffered because of the HIV AIDS virus. I started uh, a part of my ministry at the height. Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. And I was in charge of all the HIV positive people in the sea services. That's Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard. They all had to come to our cycle social center every time they were evaluated as being positive for HIV. And back then it was a death sentence. And the group that I was with, which was right across the street from NIH, was the group that developed the cocktail. And overnight, it went from a death sentence to something that you could survive and manage. Amen. When that happened, people forgot that there was still family suffering and individual suffering. And so we can't just let the fact that we have one level of technology in place negate the fact that there's still a battle out there. And the person that's going to speak to us today is right at the tip of the spear. A matter of fact, she spent this week with the, in the White House and rubbing shoulders with Fauci and those top-level people. Amen. 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 I saw the photo. You can't deny it. <laughs> I saw the photo. Uh, amen. I think you will, too. Uh, doing what needs to be done. We can't stop until there is no one, not just in the United States, not just in Bluffton, no one that's HIV positive. We must continue until we eradicate this thing from the planet. Our speaker, Sister Dafina Ward, uh, she's a, a lawyer and mother and quite an accomplished singer. She's one of those people that just does everything well. Amen. She has such a good spirit too. Because I know her face says yes and her voice says yes, but sometimes she's probably saying, Pastor, called on me again. <laughs> but I know I can call on her because her face will say yes and her voice will say yes. And uh, Brother Ward, you have to deal with whatever else is connected to that. <laughs> Brother Washington feels me. <laughs> yeah. So she is the executive director for the Southern AIDS Coalition and she's also our member and she's also a wonderful and gifted speaker. So following the singing of the Unity Choir, the next voice you'll hear will be of our own, Sister Delfina Ward, Executive Director for the Southern AIDS Coalition. Let's receive her now with hearty applause. Amen. So come, come let us adore him, kneel down before him, see worship and adore him, see oh come, oh come let us adore him, oh and kneel down before him. See worship and adore him. Come on, lift, can you lift your voice and say, Oh, come. See, oh, come. Come, let us adore him. See, kneel down, kneel down before him. See worship and worship and adore him. Oh, 
Come, let us adore him. Oh, say kneel down.
I think we can do better than that. Tell him thank you. God has been so good. Tell him thank you. Woo. I think about World AIDS Day 2020 when we were still wiping down our groceries with Clorox wipes and wondering if there would be a vaccine we'd all have access to and praying for folks who were in the hospital and suffering and worried about folks. And it was scary, y'all a year ago, and even though we're still in a pandemic, there is so much hope. We've come so far in a year, so we just need to tell him thank you. My heart is full. I appreciate Pastor Black so much for allowing me to grace his pulpit and to be in front of you all this morning. It is no small thing to be under the, under the, the leadership of a shepherd who understands that we have to have the hard conversations, that as people who are followers and believers of Christ and chasing after God in every aspect of our lives, that we must understand how to love one another. And so I'm just going to keep, till my slides come up, I'm going to just keep talking for a second. Whew. So my husband told me I can't talk for 40 minutes, so I'm going to keep it as brief as I can, and I'm Y'all got real quiet. I'm going to keep it as brief as I can and say those things that the Spirit has laid on my heart that I feel like you need to hear this morning. And so I'm going to borrow from Pastor Black and do a quick little drive-by presentation before I get into my reflection this morning. As he noted to you, um, I am the executive. I know y'all can't read that, so I'm going to make sure I get these slides to you after the fact. I serve as executive director of the Southern AIDS Coalition. We are an organization that provides leadership around intersectional advocacy. We do grant making and provide funding to community-based organizations across the South, leadership development for folks who are living with HIV and impacted by HIV, and capacity building and training in faith spaces, in organizations with public health agencies to help them all to do a better job of providing services that are affirming and loving and inclusive and culturally competent. So that is the work that I am charged to do and honored to do. And I want to share with you this morning, first, a framing around HIV. I don't ever like to go into these conversations assuming that everybody understands the basics. And so we call it an HIV 101. And since, I, I mean, I didn't want to toot my horn, but I was very excited to be at the White House this week, I must say. Um, <laughs> And it was an invitation I did not expect. I got an email or, or from the director of the White House Office of National AIDS Policy the night before Thanksgiving saying, can you come to DC? I want you to be with me when the president unveils the update to the National HIV AIDS Strategy. And what an honor that is. And it was also on the one year anniversary <laughs> the one year anniversary of me accepting a job that I told God I did not want. And so I just want to pause on that for a second. Stop running from what he has for you, okay? I ran from that job for two years. They even hired another ED that didn't work out. And God was like, I told you that's your job. So, you know, um, very thankful for that, but had an opportunity to share a space on the far left with Dr. Fauci. Um, in the middle is President Biden providing his remarks. And on the right is Harold Phillips, who is the um, president's appointed director of the White House Office of National AIDS Policy. And we had the honor in our organization of collecting information from folks all over the South to help inform the federal update around the strategy that's really going to out allow us to end the HIV epidemic in this country by 2030. That is our goal. That is our goal. And so now I want to provide for you, if you've heard me speak before, you've probably seen some of this, so just act like you haven't and just nod your head and say amen, because I have to give a framing around why HIV work in the South is so critically important and why it's something that all of us should care about. This quote from Audre Lorde is one that I look to often, and I'm going to get into some scripture, but I wanted to start here. Audre Lorde's quote, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. And that is the truth. No person is dealing just with just one thing. And in this country, the way we have couched HIV in our conversations has become stigmatizing and discriminatory. And it's become that way around the world. But I want to speak particularly to the history in the United States and why I want you all to understand why your involvement, your engagement in this fight is so important. 
This map here, which I know you probably can't see all that well, but you'll get the gist of it. This is a map that the NAACP created back in 1918. And what this map shows was the rate of lynching and race, racial violence across the country between 1908 and 1918. And where you see the darker shades, those are the places that had the most lynching. And where is that, y'all? It's the South. I use this as a framing because I need people to understand that every aspect of our system, our healthcare system, our political system, our justice system, all stem from this. And we have to understand that when we're talking about HIV in this country, particularly in the South, particularly black folks, we can't forget this. Next slide, please. And this slide here, you can go to the next one. When you look at how the South is broken out here, 49% of all deaths among people living with HIV are in the South, 49%. So half of the people who are dying from HIV-related illnesses or AIDS-related illnesses in this country live in the southern United States. But we don't even make up, what portion of the country do you think we make up in the South? About a quarter of it, population-wise. And nearly half of all AIDS-related deaths. Next slide, please. So this goes back to my point around Audre Lorde, that we cannot separate out one issue and focus on one issue when we're talking about a person's holistic wellness. I'm gonna start here because I don't know if everyone understands how HIV is transmitted. You cannot get HIV from kissing, from casual touching, from sharing food with someone, from a bug bite, from using a restroom, from taking a bath in the shower that someone else has used, from holding a baby from being close and show you care. Next slide. You can only get HIV, and I think most of us are adults here, and if there are kids, those who are big enough to understand need to know the truth anyway, so here we go. You can get HIV through sexual contact that is unprotected. People can pass it, a mother can pass it to child. However, we've got medications that have made that nearly unheard of in this country. Most time now, if you're talking about transmission from mother to child, it would be through breast milk, and there is even medication that has eradicated that in most situations. Sharing syringes, and when I talk to teenagers, I tell them that means don't go to your cousin's garage to get a tattoo, because that's a syringe too. Understanding clean syringes are necessary. And from blood transfusions, which is why blood is tested. And when you look at the rates of HIV in the South, Nearly half of the men who were diagnosed with HIV in 2019 live in the South. 56% of women living with HIV live in the South. So I need you all to understand that this framing, particularly around our community, is critically important. And I wanted to give you that before I went into my comments. And the last slide I'm going to show is this one. That yellow that you see there in that circle, that's the number percentage of black Americans. When you look at everyone who's living with HIV, black Americans, particularly in the South, 50% of HIV cases in the South. Half of all new HIV diagnoses in the South, in the region, are black people. And I don't want you to start sitting there thinking like, what kind of black people? I bet not the kind of black people in my family. Don't start that because we've got to get away from this othering of people as though it is something that exists outside of the realm of possibility in our own experiences and lives. I'm not ashamed of my past, and I talk about when I was in, in, in college and thought I was doing whatever I wanted to do, I say, well, but for God, then I'm not living with HIV. I'm just naming it, and some of y'all probably have some of those but for God thoughts too about our own experiences on our, in our own past. So I'm going to stop, stop there and get into what I wanted to share with you all as a reflection today. I hope that framing was helpful. So I'm gonna come to you from the book of Mark. Chapter five, verses 25 through 34. Mark, chapter five, verses 25 through 34. And this is the scripture in the story that I go back and read time and again when I'm trying to understand why God has me doing this work. We all have those moments in our careers and our work, right? This labor is tiring, Lord, why am I here? And it says this, and this is the NIV version. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. 
She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped. She felt in her body that she was freed from suffering. And once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, he turned around the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you. His disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. So today's reflection is entitled, Reach Out and Touch. Let's pause for a moment of prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, I just praise you today, dear God. Thank you for this opportunity to share with your people. I pray that something that comes from my mouth, dear God, that it touches someone's spirit, dear God, might it be through conviction or an urgency to express love to someone they haven't talked to in a while or to reach out to a child they have maybe just told that they don't want to be bothered because of their lifestyle or to reach out to someone who just needs a hand. God, we need to reach out and touch be it spiritually or physically, emotionally, dear God. I pray that you charge our hearts, dear God, in a way to be loving and empathetic, dear God, that is supernatural. We can't end the HIV epidemic in this country if we don't end hatred and stigma, if we don't end ostracizing and discrimination. As your children, dear God, who call ourselves Christians, soften our hearts. Let us live what you modeled as Jesus said, daughter, this world has harmed you and called you unclean, but I call you loved, dear God. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. In 1970, Diana Ross released her first solo album, Without the Supremes. Apparently, the recording for the album was daunting and challenging, and she struggled to find her voice as a solo artist. Her first single, Reach Out and Touch Somebody's Hand, was a modest commercial success. It only got to top 20 on the, on the Billboard charts and not above 20. And the Supremes were used to topping the charts with everything that they put out. And just so you know, Ashford and Simpson sang background on Reach Out and Touch Somebody's Hand, if you didn't know that. It was seen as a risk for, by her producers and her record label to depart from the feel-good music that she was famous for to release a song that was so heavily gospel-influenced and socially conscious. Previously, the Supremes had only released one song that was politically or socially focused, and I wonder if anybody knows what song that was. Love Child, very good. But years later, Reach Out and Touch Somebody's Hand is still a song that is used to unify. It became an anthem for the United Nations. She sang it at the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony in the early 2000s, and it is a call to personal responsibility to caring for one another. So 10 years after the release of Reach Out and Touch Somebody's Hand, Ross released her hit single, I'm Coming Out. Now, the songwriters describe going to nightclubs as they were hanging out with Miss Ross, trying to get her, understand her, and see what should be on her album. And they would go into these nightclubs and see all these drag queens dressed up as Diana Ross. So they came back to Diana and said, hey, these people love you. We should write a song for you that's kind of like James Brown's I'm Black and I'm Proud, but for that community. And she was like, hmm, I don't know about that. But Diana Ross decided to move forward. I'm Coming Out wasn't intentionally to her a theme for a specific community, but she felt it was a song that was needed at the time. She was told by many people that such an expression that could be seen as open expression of a community that was often thought to be problematic or sinful would be an end to her career. That by using her voice to touch that community, she'd be ostracized. That she would be a target for hate. That she would become unclean by association. And yet, she proceeded. 
That song continues to be an anthem for self-acceptance and celebration, and I don't think Diana Ross's career suffered as a result of it. I use this example because Lady Diana showed us what it looks like to use our position, our influence, our presence to touch someone. Now, less than one year after the release of I'm Coming Out, the United States saw the first diagnosis of AIDS in the summer of 1981. And with the advent of AIDS in this country and the world, people had no idea what it was. So it became known as like the gay man's cancer. And there were all these assumptions about who could get it and who, who would be susceptible to it. There was an assumption that black and brown people couldn't get it. There was an assumption that women couldn't get it. There were all of these unknowns. Does that sound familiar? All of these unknowns around who was susceptible and how. And as answers began to unfold, some partial answers, we started to stigmatize and put people in groups and make assumptions. And to Pastor Black's point, we didn't know how to treat it. Doctors like Dr. Fauci and so many others spent countless hours and years coming up with a cocktail that eventually would be able to suppress viral loads and to make it so people could build healthy white blood cells and thrive, even living with the virus. And today in the movement, there is something called U equals U, which means undetectable equals untransmittable. It has been scientifically proven. If someone is on HIV medication and their viral load is suppressed, they cannot transmit the virus. And that is why we know we can end the epidemic in this country, because there is no reason for there to be any new HIV infections if everyone in this country has access to the medications. So what does this have to do with Mark and the woman with the issue of blood? I turn to her to reflect because that is the prime example of how stigma shows up. When I talk to many of the people who I love who are living with HIV, they describe church as what they miss the most after a diagnosis. Not because they're physically unable to attend, but the thought of attending church is something they fear. Religious trauma is real, as many have been abused by faith leaders and people that they've trusted and loved and shared their own stories and experiences with have made them feel unclean. And so I challenge us to not perpetuate that, to provide spaces of love and caring so that all folks feel welcome. And I want to make three quick points about the woman. The woman with the issue is the only woman in the New Testament that Jesus calls daughter. I want you to sit with that for a moment. This one whose society had decided was unclean and unworthy was called daughter by our savior. An expression of intimate love and relationship when society had labeled her unclean and unworthy. God's love, God loves those that man might deem unlovable. Her condition was not understood. I think we ha it's important for us to think back on the time. You know, back then you didn't have gynecologists and obstetricians who could provide services to help this woman to identify what was really going on. And so this idea of unclean is very subjective and based on the times that they were living in. There was fear around things that people didn't understand, and that continues today. I wonder if we know that before the 1800s, we didn't really even wash our hands as a means of disinfection. There was a um, Hungarian gynecologist in the 1800s who's the one who discovered that disinfecting your hands and disinfecting your instruments when doing surgeries might be helpful in stopping the spread of germs. Now that's unthinkable to us now, but it's important for us to consider the context of the times that people were living in. But remember that this woman in the Bible that society had deemed unclean was loved by God and loved by Jesus openly. My second point is not the physical touch that transformed her. The power of our words, our deeds, our beliefs transform others just as they transform us. And we have to transform our minds in order to love others. We must demonstrate our faith just as the woman did. And lastly, the woman with the issue of blood was in the crowd but not of the crowd. She was in the crowd, but not of the crowd. She was not 
seen as being part of society, even though she was physically there. And you know, people can be suffering right next to you and you not even know it. And what you must do is think about what it is you're putting out that other folks are taking in. For so often we use certain words, we use certain terms, and people are listening. And I'll share this story as I, as I close. I had a girlfriend in high school who I adored. And then like most of us, we didn't talk much after high school. And one day on Facebook, I posted a picture and I was wearing a shirt that said HIV positive. And I took a picture of it, just put it on Facebook. We were doing an HIV event. And I'm not positive, but I'm always trying to like help people have conversations and to end stigma around this virus. And she happened to see my post and she inboxed me on Facebook and was like, hey, I saw your shirt. And I'm like, okay, I have HIV, is what she said in my Facebook, in my inbox. And I said, call me. So she called me. And you wouldn't have thought it had been almost 20 years since we had talked. And she shared with me about her diagnosis and how her family didn't really know. And she really wasn't going to treatment because she didn't want folks to see her going in and out of that clinic. And she was trying to see the social worker, but she was also trying to manage being a single mom. And she had a lot on her. And so we started to talk more. And I continued to try to support her and encourage her where she could. Like, who can you share with? Who can you talk to? And if I'm the only one, that's fine. But this was a reminder. She said, I don't feel like there's really anybody in my friends or my family who will understand. Some people are going to think there's something wrong with me and not want to be around me. I'm afraid that my sisters and other folks won't really want to let their kids be around me. Um, I don't want people to be scared. I don't want my kids think, to think I'm going to die. There were all of these reasons she didn't share. Some months later, she was diagnosed with cervical cancer. And that was a result of a number of catastrophic things, but her HIV diagnosis and the fact that it had really gone untreated didn't help. And women living with HIV, if untreated, can be more susceptible to reproductive health challenges and, and certain cancers. And so she became, <clears throat> she got, received her cancer diagnosis. And at that point, as we talked, I said, I hope that you'll go to a support group now. You know, there are support groups. You didn't feel comfortable talking about your HIV, but now surround yourself with other women who are going through cancer treatment. And she said, I, I don't think I'm going to do that. What if they find out I have HIV? And I don't think that that's for women with cancer. I'm not just a woman with cancer. So she wouldn't go to a support group for that either. And so as we continue to watch her go through her cancer treatments and eventually get back onto her HIV medications, the cancer ravaged her body. It ravaged her body. And we didn't talk for a few months, and I thought it was strange. I'd reach out and not hear anything back. And then one night I was at choir practice in my church in Birmingham, Alabama, and her, her partner, she had started seeing someone, called me and said, you need to come, you need to, come to the palliative unit at UAB Hospital. And I got there, and there she was, on pain medications, in and out of consciousness. And I was so thankful he called me. And I went to her bedside and squeezed her hand and just told her how much I loved her and how proud I was of her and how her kids were going to be just fine because they were surrounded by so much love. And she died about six hours later. And so every time I speak, every time I have conversations, I think of her. And there are probably people in your life like her. Someone who's feeling the need to hide, who feels like you may not understand. So I'm challenging you today to reach out and touch. To touch somebody with words that are loving and kind. To not perpetuate stigma. You don't have to be accepting of everything. I know some of y'all feel like the world is just people do whatever they want. Just love people. That's all we're called to do. You know, I don't get into folks' business. That's between you, do you? That's between you and God. But my assignment is to love you, the person. And so this World AIDS Day, as we're reflecting on 40 years of HIV in this country, the fact that a reality of ending the epidemic is in sight, this is our 33rd World AIDS Day. And World AIDS Day began as a very somber, occasion 
Because at that time, if someone received a diagnosis, they were likely going to die as a result. But that's not where we are now. We have to rejoice in the fact we have medications that are letting people live long, long lives. I didn't get to show you the slide, but they're presuming that by 2030, 70% of the people living with HIV are going to be over the age of 50. 70%. And people that I have on my team, I have one woman who's been living with HIV for 27 years, and she is 57 years old, and she keeps us all together. So, you know, there are people living and thriving with very long lives. There's one infectious disease doctor who always says, I'd rather have HIV than diabetes. He says it all the time because it is that treatable. So I want to leave you with a couple of things. One, if you do not know your status, I encourage you to get tested. Challenge your doctor to give you a test because part of the issue is that our healthcare system perpetuates stigma by acting like only certain people need to be tested. Everybody should know their HIV status. So I encourage you, if you do not know your HIV status, get a test. It's simple. And if you don't know where to go, you inbox me. I'm happy to go with you if you want me to. No judgment, promise. Or can direct you to resources if you'd like that. Also, secondly, there is a medication now called PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. It is a pill that is HIV prevention. So someone can take a pill every day to prevent becoming HIV positive if that's, look at y'all, y'all so good, if that's something that's needed. It's up on the slide. Post-exposure prophylaxis, after you've maybe have been exposed, there's a pill you can take for that too. And if there's more, you want to learn more about that, I'm happy to talk about that as well. But I'll leave you with that, this. Reach out and touch. Reach out and get accurate information. Reach out and be a source of love and support. Know your HIV status. If someone in your life is living with HIV, check in on them. Let them know that they're loved and supported. If you want more information, you can follow Southern AIDS Coalition on all of our social platforms. We love to be a resource. We love to be a support. But more than anything, Know that you are loved. Know that it is time for us to take a stand to end HIV in this country. And that we must reach out, touch, love, and support one another, no matter the health conditions. Thank you so much. Oh, let's all stand. What a word. Let's give the Lord a praise for using Sister Ward in such a powerful way. She said a mouthful. But I really like the point that she made that we don't even have to figure out why people do what they do. Just love them. Amen. Love will find a way and love will open a door. Maybe there's someone in this, under the sound of my voice that does not know Jesus Christ and the pardoning of his or her sins. Maybe you feel that your background or your experiences alienate or separate you from God. No, the same God that was open to that woman with an issue of blood is open to you. And he wants to touch you with a healing touch. We're going to ask this choir to sing, and I'm going to invite those who may need to know Jesus to just raise your hand or put in a chat, and I'll come to you. Uh, we're going to make sure that you leave this place in a relationship with Christ. Choir, will you sing?
Has, has everyone received the communion elements? Amen. I'm going to read the solicitation, and at the end of the solicitation, you may sit. You that do truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbor and intend to need a new life, following the commandments of God and walking from his forth in his holy ways, draw nigh with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession before Almighty God by sitting. New and different for AMEs to do communion standing up as a preacher. We like to kneel, don't we? Join me in the general confession. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time as grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against your divine majesty, provoking most justly your wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and, please, serve and please you in the newness of life. To the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our prayer of consecration. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of your tender mercy did give your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death on the cross for our redemption, who made thereby an oblation of himself, once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we most humbly beseech you and grant that we receiving these, your creatures of bread and wine, according to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who the same night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remissions of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You can take your elements out of the plastic. Bishop Green says, shake them up. Remove the upper layer, expose the bread. This bread is the body of Christ broken for you. Take, eat, feast on it in your heart with faith and be thankful. Remove the next layer and expose the cup. This cup is the cup of a new covenant written in Christ's blood. Drink ye all of it, knowing that Christ died for you, and be thankful. You can put the remains back into the plastic, and the students will come by and collect them.
name thank God the blood done sign whoa hallelujah hallelujah that the blood done sign my oh hallelujah hallelujah oh the blood done sign my name hallelujah hallelujah that the blood done sign my name. Thank God the blood done sign my name. Oh, Jesus told me, Jesus told me, the blood done sign. Amen. We're going to pray together, and we'll let that choir sing some more. They got another song in them, I can tell. Can't you tell? Amen. Let's pray together that one prayer that unites every Christian heart. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Traditionally, we would do our fellowship and shake hands with everybody over the building. But since we can't do that, we're going to say choir just sing, and we'll go from there. Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Church Universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings
to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before his presence and his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever.